About 60 years ago, the locomotive builder Hengel handed over to the Deutsche Bundesbahn the first member of a new locomotive class. One that would not only raise the top speed on Germany's rails, but introduce a new railway era altogether. Already in 1952, when the all-new family of electric standard locomotives for the Deutsche Bundesbahn, the Federal Railway of West Germany, was first discussed, a six-axled express locomotive, under the name E01, was conceptualized. And while everything would have been ready for developing such locomotive from 1953 onwards, the demands of the time dictated otherwise. A new electric express locomotive was simply not yet needed as the 150 km per hour top speed of the E10, the first of the standards, was more than enough for the poor post-war infrastructure. But considerations for a new flagship continued, now in favor for a much simpler 4 axle machine based on the E10 and consequently with a significantly lower top speed than the proposed E01, a consideration that turned into reality in 1962 with the class E10.12 for the new Rheingold Express train, the first regular train service after the war to reach 160 km per hour. But we've talked about both the E10.12 as well as the 1962 Rheingold before on this channel. I will link the respective playlist at the end of this video. As the condition of the rail infrastructure further improved however, and the competition from cars and aeroplanes continuously grew, the Bundesbahn saw themselves urged to further increase the speed of their express trains and the development of a from the ground up near express locomotive was inevitable. Thus, already in 1961 leading the focus back to the original E01 concept, which one year later was renamed to E03. The new locomotive was supposed to reach 200 km per hour, but not just on test runs, as it has been done plenty of times before but in regular service. This, however, posed a multitude of challenges, not solvable with traditional techniques and designs. Therefore, only very little could be reused from the standard electrics and a lot of outside-the-box thinking was required, quite literally. The most prominent of these challenges are the strong air turbulences caused by the speed of 200 km per hour, especially for passing trains. Similar to boats in the water, every train creates a bow wave in the air, which for passing objects results into a sudden increase in air pressure, followed by an equally rapid fall below, before slowly returning to the atmospheric pressure. Riders in a passing train experience this bow wave as a sideways jerk and an audible blow. If you're a regular train rider yourself, you are probably very familiar with this phenomenon. While up to 140 km per hour, the pressure differences are small enough to not cause any operational risks, even with brick-shaped locomotive bodies. This changes drastically at 200. The pressure differences caused by a box-like body shape at that speed is easily enough to burst window panes. Therefore, the new locomotive needed a much lower air resistance. To find the ideal shape, extensive trials both on models in a wind channel, as well as with the existing locomotives on the track, had to be conducted. The task, however, wasn't as simple as finding the shape with the least air resistance. The ideal shape for that was found to be a nose 4.8 meters long. Not only would that result into either impractical long overhangs, or would limit the sideways movement of the incredibly tall boogies, we come back to that, it would have also created problems for the other end. You see, the E03 was always intended to be used both ways, thus needing perfectly symmetrical caps, meaning whichever nose design was at the front of the train would also be present towards the first wagon, which by nature has a boxy shape. The aforementioned almost 5 meter long nose, while creating only a comparably weak bow wave on its own, would have caused severe turbulences between the rear nose and the first wagon. The best and most practical compromise was ultimately found in the iconic round shape of the built machines, whose noses are just 2 meters long. It was clear from the beginning that back then a locomotive so powerful would only be possible using 6 motors, thus requiring 6 axles. 
And while you might think, with that number of axles, it would be easy to incorporate the extensive electronics the locomotive needed, the reality is a lot more complicated, or dare I say, heavy. Six axle locomotives generally cause a lot of wear to the track, even more so at such high speeds. To keep the wear at a reasonable amount, the wheelbase per boogie was kept as short as possible by mounting the motors upright, giving the boogies the unusual height of 2.23 meters, and the maximum axle load was set at just 18 tons, three tons less than the much simpler mainline standard electrics. Therefore, weight savings were needed wherever possible, and since their electronic systems didn't really allow for that, it had to be searched elsewhere. Traditionally, locomotive bodies are an important part of the structure and stability of a locomotive, and as such are made from fairly heavy steel. In order for much lighter aluminum alloy to be used, however, the body can't have any static function, and a rigid frame is necessary instead. In case of the EO3, this resulted into a very prominent welded steel frame, almost one meter tall, and shaped like an upside down U, encompassing both boogies. But as this frame was still too shallow to fully cover the incredibly tall boogies, the middle section was cut out and covered with a raised platform, allowing the electronics to be mounted on top. This sturdy frame then allowed not only for a lightweight body, but also for an entirely new body plan that broke with a traditional box. The body of the EO3 consists of five parts, of which the outer two semi-permanently fixed to the frame, contain the driver cabins and the three in the middle cover the engine room. The later ones are held in place by screws and can be easily removed for repairs and overhauls, allowing for maximal access and making it easy to crane out large components. Something that simply would not be possible with a traditional locomotive body. But despite its strength, also the steel frame is not any heavier than need be, as even the sheets of the flooring are included in the static calculations, and only the bare minimum of lateral main beams are present. Two for the heavy transformer in the middle, two for the buffer beams, and none for the boogies. The traditional way of mounting boogies with a pin would result into an asymmetrical pivot point, as in the boogies middle, the middle excellent motor get in the way. All of that is fine for a heavy goods locomotive with a low top speed like the E50, but not for an express locomotive where smooth running is an utmost priority. As such, based on what has been used in France before, the boogies are mounted by two drawbars each. The mounting underneath the axles results into a favorably low pivot point, improving traction, and the fixing to the lateral beams already present on the frame means no additional ones are needed, thus saving a significant amount of weight. But the top speed of 200 km per hour also posed a completely different problem. The increased brake distance meant that the usual spacing between a distant and its home signal of 1 km was too short and would have needed to be increased to 1.5 which, however, would drastically reduce route capacity. Fortunately, modern technologies offered a much better solution. The newly developed system, with the name Linienzugbeeinflussung, short LZB, German for continuous train control, does not only receive information about upcoming signals and speed restrictions from a control center, therefore replacing physical signals, it also acts as a security measure. It continuously checks and compares the train's current speed and automatically applies the brakes when necessary. Communication with the control center happens through two cables in the track. This system does not only improve safety, but also helps to increase a route's capacity as a minimum distance between two trains is no longer governed by physical block signals, which is why many slower locomotives were soon equipped with the two. And in combination with the AFB, an automatic drive and brake control, the LZB almost allows for autonomous driving, truly entering a new era of railways. In February 1965, 
with the delivery of the first of four prototypes. The Bundesbahn had a new star in its fleet. Back then, with a continuous power output of more than 8000 metric horsepower, the most powerful single unit locomotive in the world. But unlike what it says on the tin, this locomotive was not actually E03001, as E03002 was the first one to be completed, but the not yet ready 001 was announced for ceremonial handing over to the Bundesbahn. E03002 simply masqueraded as its sister. But why does that even matter in terms of my model? Aren't they besides their number all the same anyway? Notice the pantographs. When first built, numbers 001 and 003 were fitted with a then brand new single arm pantographs, while 002 and 004 were equipped with diamond shaped ones. Something we will come back to in the future. There were also two different drives, used and tested with the prototypes, but you'd need to climb under the bogies to spot the difference. The prototypes came just in time for the 1965 EVA, the Internationale Verkehrsausstellung, International Traffic Exhibition in Munich between June and October of that year. But not just as an exhibit, as the Bundesbahn was eager to show off what their latest locomotive was really capable of. Therefore, while EO3003 spent its time mostly on the fair, the others were put on the track for a shuttle service between Munich and Augsburg. Following thorough testing to ensure the safety at high speeds, a special allowance was given for these shuttle trains to run at a speed of up to 200 km per hour, a first for passenger carrying trains in Germany. A general allowance, however, to run 200 km per hour was declined by the Ministry of Transport. So, when the four prototypes entered regular service with the following winter timetable, their speed was restricted to only 160 km per hour. For now. And there was only four of them after all. Not nearly enough to build up a network of high-speed connections between major cities. In the following years, both in regular service as well as during testing at higher speeds, their performance was closely observed to see how they would behave in continuous use, pulling various kinds of trains, to eliminate teething troubles and to improve the design even further. Before ultimately, serial production of this new class would commence. But that, my friends, is a story for another day. Thank you PR151, Contrian, Dave Heise, Flip Schwip, Kay Frankly and Lucas Ilskens for making this video possible by partially funding my research. And thank you for your interest. If you would like to support my work too, you can find all links in the video description. Or simply like the video, as this helps too. And subscribe if you want to know how the story continues. See you next time, here at Steelbridge models.